Today, we're going to move to talk about physical environment, as you see down here on this map of our path. Um, and I'm going to be handing over to Jim Kennedy and, and Juan very shortly. But before we do, I wanted to take a few moments to reflect on what we did yesterday and what was a really important session on transition and the nexus. So um, I'm going to ask Juan to, to come and join us. She and Giovanni were, were leading that session yesterday. But before I do, I'm going to ask uh, you folk to think about something, if that's OK. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to ask this question of you. So are we promoting the nexus or are we embedding silos? So when we talk about the, the triple nexus, when we talk about development and humanitarian and peace coming together, it's very easy to look at those really sort of big organizations or big powers and say, you know, well, how are we supposed to work if the donors or the governments or the, the really big NGOs or the UN agencies are not supporting us? But I think a lot of this action actually comes down to us as individuals. So I'd like to ask you a few questions and I'd like you to think about what you do as an individual, what your team does, and also what your organization does. So if you grab your phone and you type in menti.com and you put in the code at the top, you'll have a chance to answer these questions. So I want you to think, to give a quick example, the way your organization is funded, do you think that embed silos or do you think it promotes the nexus? If you think it completely promotes the nexus, give it a five. If it completely embeds silos, give it a one. And if it's halfway between, score it three. And I think you can work out the rest. So just take a moment to do that. Have a think about whether the actions of your organization, your team, and you as an individual are actually promoting the nexus or whether you're embedding silos. I think it'll be interesting to see what sort of results we get. And whilst we're doing that, I'm going to ask Wan to join me. She's busy putting in the answers. I can't do both. I can't do both. <laughs> so we'll give her a chance to answer whilst we look at these scores coming up on the screen. With this sort of chart, don't just look at the numbers, also look at the shape of the hills behind, because the shape of the hills behind represent the distribution of results. So you can see where folk are. So we're, we're, as ever, quite confident in the decisions we make and the way that we communicate as individuals. Um, it's interesting. The further things get away from us, the more they often are to blame for uh, the silos that we, we see. So Juan, tell me a bit about yesterday. So we had three really important speakers from a very high level talking about this work in terms of the nexus and the transition. What came out of yesterday for you that was positive in this regard? Um, I think it's, for me, it was really interesting to hear about very like different perspective on, you know, one of the key issues that are being discussed throughout the humanitarian and, and development, I guess, uh, communities. Um, it's, and I think it's, it's, my big takeaway is that it seems so kind of insurmountable. It's sort of like this big, complex, complicated thing. But I think seeing examples from, you know, both Nigeria and, and Kurdistan, um, region of Iraq is also, to see it be like broken down into pieces and addressed. And I think this is something we need to keep sort of chipping away at. I think there's so many different components and, and the different stakeholders and different sort of pieces of the puzzles that need to be put together for it to work. My big, another big takeaway for me is also around preparedness that needs to be carried out before there's even displacement in order to ensure transition and nexus conversation can, can happen. Um, I think it was, it was a great opportunity just to hear people who are working, you know, on this chipping away of this block of what we call the nexus or transition um, and coming at it from different angles and, and, you know, approaching it trial and error and then 
reapproaching it and readdressing the thing in order mm. to try and preserve you know the rights and the dignity of the displaced population i'm also glad to see that we do have a role to play within this broader conversation from both camp management operations as well as cccm cluster and yeah, yeah so but do you i mean there's a, I, I often get a feeling that we're just not moving fast enough on this. We, we talk a lot about it, but we've been talking about this, frankly, about the, the division between humanitarian and development for decades in reality. Um, and yet we're not moving. And I, I'm going to throw this question out to everybody. We've just tipped past 70 participants. So it's a little bit risky here with, with just a few minutes. But if anyone has a view on, did you, did you attend the session yesterday? Did you get a positive feeling that we're actually moving in the right direction on this? Or did you feel like we're just stagnating? Throw your answers into the chat, put, put, put your neck on the line and tell us what you think. And if, if you've really got a strong view, raise your hand, virtual hand, because um, we can't see all of you and, and feed into this because this is a, I think it's a really important debate. If you've just joined us, grab your phone and go to Menti. Uh, put in that code at the top and have a look at if your organization, your team and your individual actions you think are embedding silos or promoting the nexus and, and have a go at those things. So, so Dare, you've got your hand up. What, Thank do you you. what did you get from this? Thank you. No, I think yesterday I was in and out. And again, as one mentioned, the countries gave me one thinking for the CCCM cluster. And I would really like to share this with all the colleagues here that I know, and I'm delighted to see. It's really nice to see you. I'm fortunately not in person this time. I hope next time, surely in person, we will meet. But I, I find it fascinating that CCCM cluster, which normally we deal with the most onset phases of the crisis is discussing nexus and discussing solutions and our contribution to it. The way I was following up the discussions yesterday, it's, it's just proving the fact that nexus is a discussion. I agree with you, Charlie, that we are happening. It's discussions are happening, but indeed there are different definitions for our input and the contribution to the nexus and the and the all the transition and the all the solution which i think needs to be defined in a clearer way mm -hmm. for cccm cluster i see that we are acting in a hospital structure like the emergency unit and to be able to to defer the first steps of the nexus is more or less like this emergency unit referring cases to other units of the cluster and i think with this discussion, it's very obvious that we should not only focus at treating the symptoms of displacement, but equally and at the same time to engage with different actors to identifying solutions, given that while we speak about Nexus, Charlie and the colleagues and Juan, while we speak about Nexus, the numbers of IDPs in camps, which is exactly the opposite, is increasing percentagely compared to the history, which means that the solutions are becoming lesser and lesser, and that's why we have to invest further on the nexus. And I think, and I believe that this is also going to be included in uh, our strategy discussions over. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. really good point. So, so controversial question then, is the role of CCCM about this triage? Is it, is it about the, the, this kind of, this very sharp end of emergency? But then on the other side, as, as they're saying, you know, that there's these symptoms that are, that are causing this and that relates to development stuff as well. So should CCCM be one of the leaders in, in pushing towards working between humanitarian and development? Again, put your views in the chat, raise your hand if you've got an idea. Juan, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I see some of the comments and, and I think it's, it was interesting to hear from the government, particularly yesterday, because to understand that a lot of the things that need to be put into place is part of the government administrative system. You know, and I think it doesn't come so easily or um, I think ensuring like the system to be put into place for let's say people to access housing loans, you know, as part of return process if you come to the point when you're talking about return, but you don't have the system in place on how people, how to assess damage and how people can access and documentation needed. 
then it's going to take a very long time to, to put forward that, um, that change and that process. But I think, I mean, I agree with, um, with the, I mean, it's funny because I always use the comparison of like the concierge in a hotel is like CCCM, you know, is that we're that front desk. And, and I think our big role is not only to, um, you know, ensure kind of quality of life, access to information, assistance, protection during displacement, but it's also one of our big role to push and advocate for durable solutions. And I think we then act as a people that ensure that the process is consultative, that is, um, you know, centered around the displaced, the host population. Um, and, and I think that we, you know, facilitate that, that initial conversation on how this is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And I think we, I mean, we take that role very seriously, obviously, because it's one of our kind of five uh, standards for, for camp management. Um, yep. Okay, so thank you both um, and, and everyone who's feeding in. There, there are 77 people in the room, only 26 have responded to this mentee, so only about a third of you. So if you haven't yet, grab your phones. We're really interested in this data. I think it's fascinating and I think this is an indicative thing about change more generally that we believe that our individual actions are helping. We've got 3.8 and 4 scoring down here in terms of the decisions we make and the way we communicate. We as individuals are all promoting the nexus, or at least the 26 people who responded are. But the way our team's working is less promotional of the nexus. We're scoring 3.2 and 3.3. And then the way our organization is funded and structured is even less. So, but, but we are elements within these teams and we're elements within these organizations. And I always think there's an interesting dichotomy here between what we feel like we're doing as individuals, but yet these bigger forces are preventing us from doing it. So, so it's, it's an interesting deb debate to be had and there's some good chat coming through. I'm gonna leave this mentee open. Um, so feel free, if you haven't, if you're one of the uh, 52 people that hasn't yet responded to it, just grab your phone, type in menti.com into your internet browser, put in that code and, and give us your thoughts on this because we'd really welcome this data. I think it'd be very useful. We could talk about the Nexus all day, but I should probably stop sharing and hand over to today's session. So today is about physical environment and um, our, our lead facilitators today are going to be Jim Kennedy, but I'm going to hand over to, to Juan, who's going to open the session. So over to you, Juan. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, today, we're going to be talking about physical environments related to displacement sites. And I think everyone here would agree that physical environment has strong impact on our quality of life, on our well-being, um, and it can also impact the way in which we behave, whether individually or collectively. Um, it impacts our sense of safety and security. And it also, you know, impacts our sense of communities. So I think it's not a surprise that it's so important for all camp management or site management um, operations and clusters, um, the component around physical environment and all the land or the building that people are living in during displacement. Um, so, you know, and, and I would invite you at some point after today to also have a look at our, um, the minimum standards for camp management, um, which is being finalized on standard three is around physical uh, site and environment. And for today, I'm, I think most of you would already know Jim Kennedy, who's going to be our moderator for a panel discussion. Um, that is coming up straight up after me. Um, I will also share with you the fact that we're going to be having a breakout session um, after the break. Um, there'll be four breakout sessions. The first one will be on connectivity, energy, and environment, um, led by Jorn, Joseph, and Brian. And then we have a really interesting, sorry, I'm not, I'm just, I wasn't trying to be biased. <laughs> We all, we'll also have a, a breakout session with Kerry on informal real estate in camps. So talking about informal buying and selling of land um, that happens in camps that we manage. Um, then we have Jim hosting the third breakout session on 10 things you should know about site planning as a camp manager. 
And then lastly, in the fourth group, we'll have um, Alberto and Jessica from um, Nigeria um, to talk about their efforts to overcome uh, congestion in camps over there. So, sorry, I just saw Jennifer's um, comment to me about my earrings today. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I mean, I don't have much more to say, so I'm gonna hand over to Jim um, who's going to take us away for this really interesting, so I should mention that um, the panel discussion today is going to be looking at, um, you know, I think the physical environment versus sort of social and behavioral changes in response and preparedness to COVID-19. So I'm not going to give it all away and I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Great. Thanks very much, Juan. Um, if I could ask all of the panelists uh, to gently switch on their audio and video um, so that I can then ask the panelists to also start to introduce yourselves in a second. Um, so the, this session is a panel discussion. Um, it is about the site environment. Um, none of the panelists are site planners. Uh, we've got people from plant management, we've got people from WASH, we've got people from health, we've got somebody from urban planning, um, but we don't have any site planning engineers with us. Um, I think that's absolutely appropriate. Um, as Juan says, a lot of the discussion for uh, until the, the break um, will be on the overlap or the lack of overlap between any emerging learning for site planning interventions that might help us cope with and help those living and working in the sites cope with uh, COVID-19 or any other uh, pandemic situations and behavioral adaptation and learning um, which uh, might also or should also be part of, of, that, uh, of that support system. So what is the overlap between any ad hoc um, site planning interventions, insertions, and um, the, uh, the behavioral changes, uh, the education campaigns, uh, things like that, which, uh, which we're also starting to learn more and more about. Um, that being the case, I'd like to bring the panelists forward um, in no particular order, Elena, Eric, Mohammed, and Daniel. Um, and if you could just switch on your videos and your audios. Um, and then maybe we ask everybody to introduce yourselves one by one, just say uh, who you are, why you think you're here, um, and then why you think you shouldn't be here if you want. Uh, and just do a quick round of introductions um, for the panelists. And then uh, what I will do is to start our panelists off with uh, a couple of questions. Um, Elena, maybe you start with me? Yeah. Hey, hello everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm Elena Archipovete. I'm an urban planner. And uh, I am at the moment nor roving as a NORCAPPER, as an emergency site planner. So I think I, I'm, I'm here. That, that's why I'm here to actually learn and, and share some of the insights. Excellent, thank you. And we'll be talking with Elena a lot about urban planning and site planning and COVID-19. Um, maybe just going uh, down my list, uh, Eric, are you there? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can, I can. Yeah, so uh, I, th I think I'm here um, <laughs> um, because I've been doing some stuff around um, uh, zoning in the care home context in the UK um, regarding coronavirus. Um, and so everything around, you know, uh, around zoning a building where you've got communal living spaces um, to reduce the risk of uh, infection 
of the virus. Um, and we've recently got into ventilation of uh, communal spaces as well. Um, so that, I think that's why I'm here. Um, maybe I can feed into some, maybe it has relevance for some, with this, some of the work you guys are doing. <laughs> Absolutely possible. Uh, this is why you're here. Exactly. Um, and then number three, Mohammed. Um, yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, hi, colleagues. So thanks, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, important forum of CCCM champions, experts around the world. And thank you so much. So I'm uh, Mohammed Shafiq. I'm the health cluster coordinator working with WHO in uh, Northeast Nigeria, supporting the humanitarian response and also supporting the ongoing COVID response in the Northeast currently, um, supporting the, uh, the people who are facing challenges in terms of access to healthcare, et cetera. So I will be more, I will discuss something more on the ongoing humanitarian response in the health sector and also uh, about the COVID, ongoing COVID response in IDP camps and settlements. Thank you. Excellent, and very much welcome on board. And, and then last but very much not least is Daniel here with us. Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, calling in from Cox Bazaar. Um, I am the CWC technical officer for IOM uh, and I sit within site management. Uh, I believe I'm here because of my work during COVID where I ran a large volume of community consultations uh, covering a range of issues, uh, some of which, uh, you know, related directly towards the construction of quarantine and isolation facilities, but we looked at a, a wide range of issues uh, over that period of time. Excellent. And maybe I can start off just throwing out the easy questions. Um, and why don't we sort of roll backwards the way we came in? So start with Danny and then end up with Elena. Um, just basically, I mean, Danny, you were saying that you have been very deeply involved in very specific uh, COVID-19 programming. Um, to take a step back, how have things changed in total since, since March this year or since uh, when the first cases or the first restrictions came in in Cox's Bazaar? Um. It's really hard, to, I would say, to summarize all of the impacts, um, especially because I think we're still learning what some of those impacts are. Uh, at the beginning of the response, uh, partially as a decision uh, by the Bangladeshi government, uh, was to reduce humanitarian foot presence for non-essential services in the camps by uh, 80%. Um, this obviously had a, a severe impact. Uh, on many services, many services were actually stopped. That include uh, GBV, nutrition services, education services, um, all of which obviously to kind of reduce the likelihood of transmission. Um, I think we're we're learning now that that's um, that, and along with like stopping activities like cash for work, um, has has actually really had a, a significant and, and detrimental impact on the population. Um, we, we also saw that because of, uh, let's say, a dynamic of mistrust that developed over COVID, that we saw um, hospital visits during the, the peak of the epidemic drop 75%. Um, so, so COVID is, is something we're still living with uh, in an interesting way, more in terms of the, the secondary impacts that, that we've had to, to kind of incur as a result of the, the response itself. Mm. Yeah, and I think this is something which I want to go back to over the next couple of questions. We'll continue the round, but um, not just site planning, but you know what has been the impact on other projects which can also feed into site planning, into GBV risk mitigation issues, but also into uh, cash in terms of its use for uh, public space upgrades and shelter upgrades as well. That's really interesting. Um, Mohammed, it's the same question. Um, your world must have been totally turned upside down. You're, you're the health guy. <laughs> yeah. How have things been looking since, since March? Yeah, it's, it's very tough, I will say. So I will talk more first about the operational challenges, the access challenges in the uh, working in a highly insecure environment in the northeast of Nigeria. Currently, uh, we are facing both the, the humanitarian crisis and also providing support to the ongoing COVID response. So in northeast Nigeria, we are working in a very complex operational environment within limited humanitarian space, which is continuously shrinking. Uh, we have more than uh, 2 million IDPs living in camps, in camps like settlements, in, in hosting communities. Uh, we have many areas uh, which are no-go areas for the humanitarian community, for the humanitarian agencies. 
uh, those areas are under the control of uh, Boko Haram in Islamic State uh, of West Africa province, another uh, uh, non-state armed group, which is controlling major area along the Lake Chad, uh, Lake Chad region and along the border region with uh, Niger in Cameroon. So security situation is continuously deteriorating despite the counterterrorism and military operations by the Nigerian military and their multinational task force, the non-state armed groups, they are attacking uh, more soft targets, uh, hospitals, schools, communities, civilian population. So insecurity has a direct impact on the health response. In some situations, it causes more collateral damages uh, uh, to the health system. Uh, so overall, the, the uh, operation environment is becoming more complex, more tough, and more challenging uh, for the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian agencies to operate. So as I said, access is a big challenge. Health partners are facing uh, access challenges to deliver health services for both COVID and to maintain essential healthcare uh, services in a highly insecure uh, environment in deep field locations in the border areas along with the three international uh, borders with uh, Cameroon, Chad and Niger. Uh, road movement is another big challenge uh, for partners. They mainly rely on the UNHAS uh, helicopter services, uh, which also hamper the healthcare service delivery. Uh, currently, most of the partners, they are relying more on the PC1 activities, more life-saving activities, and more uh, uh, prioritized activities in the context of COVID. Although we have low number of COVID cases, but the situation is more, is more risky in terms of uh, security. Uh, so that's a big challenge. And then uh, extremely congested living conditions in some of the IDP camps. Uh, we have more than, uh, according to system estimation, more than 400 IDP, uh, 400,000 IDPs. Uh, living in 51 um, uh, highly congested camps, uh, 28 are in the capital, in the metropolitan area, and 23 in the deep field locations. Uh, we have around 200 uh, IDP camps, some are spontaneous camps, some are camps like settlements where uh, humanitarian needs are huge, especially in wash, shelter, food, and other sectors. Uh, rainy season has just ended, so so far we don't have any cholera cases in the three states. So northeast is, is include three states. It's a three states response. So, uh, but Borno is one of the uh, state which is uh, severely affected by the ongoing um, uh, insecurity and ongoing humanitarian crisis. We are a region with high uh, rate of malaria. So recently, WHO and partners, they, uh, they implemented uh, malaria campaigns in those high-risk areas where the malaria cases are, are high. Uh, then heavy rains and floods is another, uh, another uh, factor which contribute to miseries of the communities, especially in camps with increasing public health threats, floods and ra uh, heavy rains also cause heavy damages to camp infrastructure, drainage system, et cetera, latrines, washing places. Uh, we have the challenge of attacks on healthcare facilities by the non-state armed groups, which also uh, somehow uh, hamper the health services and not only the services, but also loss of investment and in, um, lives of health staff is also at risk um, in, the, in the other three states. So overall, we are facing a challenge of huge needs and uh, diminishing resources. The healthcare services are overstretched due to variety of factors like limited resources, limited response capacity. We have mainly the response is mainly supported by the international NGOs in the UN agency. There's a li limited support from the government because the government staff they are mostly uh, uh, um, limited to to urban area, so they're not they are not they are down in the deep field locations. Uh, we have a high disease burden in the Northeast, especially I said malaria, then the diarrheal diseases, cholera. This year we were lucky that we, uh, we didn't face the cholera um, uh, outbreak. Uh, we have high number of measles. Uh, last February, we closed a, a huge measles outbreak, then the, the malnutrition issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Then in many locations- well, Hamid, the, can, I, can I cut in a little, just because I want to bring in some other people into the discussion, uh, other panelists. Um, but also try and uh, see if we can keep the discussion closer to the COVID. I'm just going to jump through our other two panelists, if, if you'll forgive me for this one, Mohammed. Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Elena, um, again, my same question that I asked uh, Mohammed and, and uh, Danny beforehand. Um, how have things been changing for you uh, since, since March? Uh, well, it's I, I I would like to bring the the attention. I think the the main thing for as as being an urban planner, um, it's changed the you know the priorities. What do you do first, and with whom you actually coordinate? And I think 
here what it comes, you know, the, the health sector and uh, uh, the local authorities and especially the grassroots uh, organizations in the cities been really strongly coordinating in some of the places really successfully. And I think then, you know, for, for the urban planners comes only like as, as being part and, and seeing where it's possible to assist with the knowledge of the way built environment functions and the way it might affect uh, the spread. So, so that's, that's, I think, my, my biggest kind of uh, outcome in, in the views of also the urban, urban planners role in all this. Mm. And um, yeah, and, and I think that's that's still ongoing learning because the, the other aspects that I would kind of later try to also highlight the role and um, the catalyst uh, role that public open space actually plays in all of this and especially in the dense environments. Mm. I want to ask you in a little while, I'm, I'm going to move on to Eric, but I want to ask you in a little while about um, how urban planning authorities uh, have tried to uh, limit or manipulate um, mm. open spaces, uh, you know, even just changing of foot traffic circulation, yeah. something simple like that. And what are those implications if we look at that same efforts as applicable or not applicable? To camps and sites, but I want to I want to follow that up in a second. Um, I know that Eric has been very patient at, at, at the last of the queue. Um, uh, Eric, uh, you have been working in areas this year with uh, what could be termed high humanitarian need, um, residential homes, and then advising the UK government. If I could think of one organisation that needed more that had a higher humanitarian need, it would be the UK government. Um, how have things changed for you? Yeah, well, we were doing our own emergency response here in the UK. <laughs> um, uh, we we uh, this was back in March um, uh, when you know we were sort of because you know having done Ebola and cholera and this kind of other nasty bugs before in previous other places, um, uh, we thought well maybe we could contribute to this particular nasty bug here. You know, we have some learning about infection control, about um, you know thing. Well, you know. We, we had some things we could give. So we were try, I was trying in March to sort of cast around and see if I could contribute somewhere and no doors were open. It was like nobody needed any help. So um, I sort of got on the standby list for MSF at the time because they had a roster and they might have been doing something with the homeless in London and so on like that. Um, and during that whole process, started to get my head into understanding, well, okay, let me, let me try to, in preparation to do something, whatever that would be, uh, let me try to research about the virus and how does it spread and it's not it's not Ebola it's different right so it's a respiratory virus and how is that different and how will that impact on IPC you know um, infection prevention and control so when I sort of started to go down the rabbit hole of that and you realize that the government UK government uh, guidance was completely useless um, because it didn't take into account asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission which if you're trying to control infection, well, that's a, that's a pretty major point to <laughs> sort of miss out on. Uh, that didn't actually come into the guidance till the end of June. But so we had sort of March, April, May, where we had this nonsense going on with the care, especially around care homes, because there was a very vulnerable environment. Commu well, communal living spaces, these spaces are not designed for infection control. They're designed for communal living. So um, we just sort of then adapted what we knew about the, uh, viral transmission to the care home setting uh, in a sort of best guess sort of pragmatic approach it's not perfect but it'll have to do kind of thing um, we put that online mid-April um, and then it went much further than we ever imagined it would go um, somehow we were sort of nagging on Twitter and pushing here and emailing here and emailing there and finally um, it seems to have gained traction and now it's been quite widely incited and discussed around the place, um, including the British Geriatric Society, uh, the European Division of WHO, the Care Quality Commission and so on and so forth. So it's gone quite far. Um, so all the stuff is on a website. It's, but, but it, again, it's really based around care home context. Um, so that's been a very interesting for me to see the last um, months how 
infection prevention and control in the UK is not necessarily rigorous enough, like, you know, other countries have done a lot better because they may be used to funny viruses and bugs and getting getting it sorted, you know. So a lot of, you know, places where we would normally go to help out in Africa, they were doing a lot better than we were. We're not used to this kind of uh, rigorous infection control we need. Um, mm. So that would be an interesting learning point for me. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think I've, I've got a, a, a question, Eric, um, that, you know, of course, you have many, many years experience working in science camps, settlements uh, around the world. You and I first met in a large camp in northeast Kenya uh, 14 years ago. Um, and I think, you know, for, for all of us, especially those coming from CCCM background, uh, uh, one of the mantras has always been to use site planning to increase access, to make sure that everybody has equitable access to the whole site. And yet, a lot of the work, if I'm understanding correctly, that you've been doing um, has actually been trying to sort of create um, separations of zones um, to make sure that there, there isn't free uh, transmission um, and that either those working in or those living in some of the facilities uh, are not having free access into other areas. How do, is that sort of limitation realistic, possible, uh, either in some of the larger collective centers or actually in the, in the open open door, open air um, sites that we see around the world. Uh, are there lessons learned from what you've been doing that can be used uh, to control movement, to, uh, to do IPC uh, in sites, in camps? Yeah, I would say it's probably, I mean, my guess it would be just dependent on if it's out, you know, open air or, or closed. So it seems, you know, with this particular virus, again, it depends which virus you're talking about. So if it's an airborne virus and, you know, yes, it, we reduce infection by cleaning surfaces and hand hygiene and stuff. We reduce the infection by a certain amount, but there's a big risk if you're in a stuffy room with many people for a long time and that room is quite small. Um, so you'll see in the ventilation part of the document, you know, we, we actually got together with a few other global leaders on that they've done airborne modeling and stuff but it's basically the risk is where you've got an indoor setting you've got more people the room isn't so big and people are going to stay there a long time and you don't have mechanical ventilation as in bringing air mechanically from outside and extracting the stale air from inside um so that's the risk setting so i suppose it depends which setting you're talking about there uh in terms of design i mean we we, we had a um, we, we had a I had a Zoom call quite a while back now with some guys in Argentina, I think, who were architects looking at, and they, they were actually part of this, I forget what it was, some kind of, um, it was some, some, some sort of similar thing, a sort of global planning slash site planning slash building construction design thing, um, looking at uh, all kinds of setting, including humanitarian settings. And they had... Um, they had some proposals along the lines of, well, if we're going to design something from scratch, we may as well design it for, you know, to be able to cope with this kind of situation. So I suppose it's, it's for me, that would make sense. But for those indoor environments, which are high occupancy, probably, and possibly where, where ventilation can't be done. So maybe colder climates, especially because you have to shut the doors and windows. I don't know if that helps the mm. question. Yeah, I mean, is, is, are there practical ways, or maybe we'll move this to Elena, because um, Elena, you have been looking at open space use, not just the closed spaces of, uh, of collective centers, but urban planning. Um, is it practical to take any of those efforts that uh, municipal governments have been trying to do in some cities uh, to try and either close down urban spaces, open spaces, or trying to redirect flow of traffic or reduce flow of traffic or disperse pedestrians. Is that realistic for a, for a site, for a camp environment? Uh, and if so, could you imagine how that could be achievable? I, I 
I think what what recently kind of dries off in in the public space, especially when it comes to control, uh, I think that's that, that's a d difficult one to actually take and uh, apply it everywhere because it's so contextual. And what we also need to to think of that public space actually is an asset. Then you have the uh, overcrowding in the you know in the in the buildings. Then you have the overcrowding in the rooms, because the the public space becomes the asset or open actually space, not even to, calling it a public space. The open space becomes the assets for for you know the for the security of the, of the girls and women. It becomes a distribution place. It becomes applicable if if you look at it as as like a, a flexible function space. It, it really becomes a, a catalyst uh, for, for our kind of future strategies, the way we design or the way we allocate the, the open space in the, in the built environments, if we have a say on uh, allocation. And, um, and then I, I think this all tries of a, of a control doesn't really work because we have not to forget that this pandemic really have a huge effect, psychological effects on the way people move. And it's already the restrictions, you know, in some places with the masks, even walking in the forest, uh, restrictions of, of how, how long, you, how many meters you can go outside your house uh, becomes actually more uh, a harm than the contribution to the something that we still uh, don't know. And, and I think that, you know, that the change of the, of the way that public space can actually become you know, some cities were calling it the open living room and open air cafe and what, what, whatever you want to call it. But I think it has a huge opportunities uh, to, for, for the future development. Uh, but we have to ensure that there is, you know, a, an access to these places and they, that they are equally distributed throughout. Because what we see in really like dense informal environments that we don't have enough of these open spaces that could be used for the different functions in the crisis situations. Mm. I mean, it's been a very interesting question that's just come through in the chat. Um, I don't know if you were able to see it, Elena, and it's a question about whether COVID-19 is going to change any of the site planning standards or should change site planning standards. And of course, when you go to uh, SPHERE or UNHCR Handbook for Emergencies, there's, there are standards, not just for indoor space, not just you know, how many square meters per person per shelter, but as a sort of calculation, a rule of thumb of how many square meters um, throughout the camp on the assumption that most of that is actually gonna be outdoor space. Um, so the, I guess the question is, will we need to, should we, can we, um, it change that balance even more and try and create even more open space. Is it enough to say, well, instead of 15 square meters